Good evening and welcome. My name is Noah Rauch. I am the Senior Vice President for Education and Public Programs here at the 9-11 Memorial and Museum. It's my pleasure to welcome all of you to tonight's program. As always, I'd like to extend a special thank you uh, and welcome to our museum members and those tuning in to our live web broadcast at 9-11memorial.org slash live. Tonight we are joined by C. Christine Fair for a conversation examining the tenuous and fraught relationship between the United States and Pakistan. Christine is a Provost Distinguished Associate Professor in the Peace and Securities Program in Georgetown University's Edmund A. Walsh School of Foreign Service. She was previously a senior political scientist with the RAND Corporation, a political officer with the United Nations Assistance Mission to Afghanistan, a senior researcher at the United States Institute of Peace Center for Conflict Analysis and Prevention, as well as a senior fellow at West Point's Combating Terrorism Center. Christine's research focuses on political and military affairs in South Asia. She has authored, co-authored, and co-edited several books and is an active contributing writer for The Atlantic, Foreign Policy, and Foreign Affairs. Christine's extensive knowledge of Pakistan and the larger region makes her a sought after voice on this topic and we are especially fortunate to have her with us here tonight. We'd like to thank Christine for sharing her time and insights with us. We are also deeply grateful to the David Berg Foundation for their support of the museum's 2017-2018 public program season. Please join me in welcoming C. Christine Fair in conversation with Executive Vice President and Deputy Director of Museum Programs, Clifford Shannon. Thank you, Noah, and welcome, everybody. It's nice to see you this evening. Thank you so much, Professor Fair, for coming here. Um, Thank you for having me. Good. Let's be very clear. <laughs> to talk about Pakistan in this building, it's, uh, it's it, it, I hate to overuse that word surreal, but it really is. Well, let's, 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 you know, we have, as a country, been at war for many years. We were, uh, ha were and have been at war in Afghanistan and in Iraq other places as well, but Pakistan has not specifically been a field of combat, but it looms over so much of what has happened in these recent years. And of course, going back before 9-11, there is a very long history of intense involvement and then complete estrangement and then back after 9-11. And so describe, if you can, the contours of this relationship between the United States and Pakistan going back to and you have to go back a ways, I realize, so I'll ask you to not make it, you know, the lecture that you could otherwise give. <laughs> but, um, you know, what's that, what are the ups and downs of this, have, uh, have they been, and where are we now? So let me say that perhaps one of the best books on this is written by Ambassador Hussein Akani called Magnificent Delusions. And I think the title pretty much summarizes it. For a briefer version, I recommend um, a book called Riding the Roller Coaster, written by uh, Teresita and her husband, who's now deceased, Howard Schaefer. That's a 100-page version of the same story versus a 700-page. But in some ways, our relationship bi bilaterally begins in the late 50s. Pakistan had been soliciting US support literally from the time it became independent in 1947. Part of the reason is when the British left the subcontinent and divided up the subcontinent into India and Pakistan. Pakistan was really the loser of partition. And, and again, I could elaborate upon this for hours, but um, Pakistan's entire governance apparatus was shambolic. And while the army had no complete units, it was the least shambolic of the others. And the first thing that Pakistan did was it went to war with India. And it's a fairly brazen move, right? Because even after partition, India still was uh, militarily much more um, least conventionally superior to Pakistan. So Pakistan began saying things that we, we would really kind of laugh at if, if you were to see it in, you know, in text, but they would say things like, you know, um, our army could be yours if you just give us the money. And they were asking for extraordinary sums of money. And you have to remember, at this time, the United States was very much involved in the reconstruction of Europe. But they were asking for a sum of money in excess, for example, of what we were paying out in the Marshall Plan. I mean, it, it, the dis distance between where we were as a country and where Pakistan wanted us to be could not have been further. And what changed this was actually the Korean War. And we realized that we have to have our own Asia policy, that it was no longer adequate to just outsource our policy to the British. So 
We began a series of alignments um, with uh, the Baghdad Treaty, and then when Baghdad um, throughout uh, withdrew, um, it changed names. And then we also had CETO, which was the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization. But the Pakistanis wanted to be a member of these treaty organizations because they really wanted money and military assistance to rebuild their military. And we really wanted them to be a part of a coalition against communism. And in some sense, this is where our relationship goes wrong. But very few people appreciate that. We were engaging and arming them and training them so that they could become counterinsurgents with us. That when you read Pakistan's military journals at the time, they were actually learning from us how to be insurgents. So this relationship uh, went under false pretenses until the 1965 war. We cut Pakistan Paki and India. 1965. The 1965 war between Pakistan and India. We cut both countries off. It affected Pakistan more because it was more dependent upon our systems. And Pakistan remained cut off. Um, another fabulous book is called The Blood Telegram by Gary Bass. And he tells the story of how Nixon um, illegally armed Pakistan in that 1971 war, which freed Bangladesh. Um, but apart from those illegal efforts in the Nixon administration, we didn't have a relationship with Pakistan really until after the Soviet Union invaded. In fact, we had sanctioned Pakistan in April of 1979 because of advances in its nuclear program. And what was happening in the late 70s, Pakistan on its own time and its own dime began a jihad policy in Afghanistan. And you know, the United States, after the Soviets invaded, we had to figure out how to undo those sanctions. Um, and it was very difficult to do. So we don't get the sanctions undone until Reagan is in office and Congress uh, relieves those sanctions in 1982. And this relationship continues until it doesn't anymore. And we re-invoke sanctions that had been previously suspended. Um, and that happens in 1990. And then we are estranged again until 9-11 happens. In fact, not only are we estranged, we are heavily sanctioning Pakistan. And so what happens after 9-11 is that I think the Bush administration uh, suffered from the fact that after the Cold War had, had ended, we got rid of all of our South Asia analysts. And people just didn't understand this country anymore. All that expertise was in repurposed. In the government, you in mean the, government. the intelligence community, the State repurposed. Department, and so on. Yeah. And I think they misunderstood um, what was so important to Pakistan. And some of the very early assurances that Musharraf saw it, like do not let the Northern Alliance take Kabul, we failed to understand, we being the government. Um, and that really sowed the seeds for Pakistan to very aggressively begin undermining us. And so I think it's, I think Carlotta Gall's book, uh, The Wrong Enemy, summarizes the situation perfectly well. We've been fighting a war in Afghanistan, but it's really Pakistan that's been, that's been killing so us. So you, you say um, Pakistan has been undermining us, and mm -hmm. I'm assuming you're thinking of the more recent times and the campaign um, in Afghanistan. Let me ask you to be more specific about what you mean by Pakistan undermining the U.S. effort in Afghanistan. So to put a very fine point on it, from 2004, if not earlier, Pakistan began actively re-supporting the Taliban. So for many people who, who are not South Asianists and weren't following the ins and outs of this conflict, by 2004, we thought we had won Afghanistan. We thought we had defeated the Taliban. But all we really did was rout them. And so we came in through the north with the Northern Alliance, and we pushed them south, and they went into Pakistan, where they, along with al-Qaeda, uh, took sanctuary, is, is, well, is as well known, right? Let me, let me just interrupt yeah. and ask if we can bring up the map of the region, the oh, yeah. political um, I think map I... of the region. It, they'll get it. Um, there you go. So as we're talking about this, you can see Afghanistan there at the top center. Driving them south into Pakistan is what the result of the U.S. invasion was. So I think perhaps a better map will be slide number six. Okay. Because this actually, so do you see that color in pink that, that looks like a schmear of salmon locks? Um, uh, you know, I'm sure they use that reference all they, the time in Pakistan <laughs> as well. That's, that's true. That wasn't a very uh, halal reference. <laughs> yeah. But so that's called the federally administered tribal areas. 
And we came down through the north of Afghanistan. So of Afghanistan, you see that little thumb here. We came through the north with the Northern Alliance, and we pushed the Taliban and their Al-Qaeda associates south. And they went to that area first, which is this, this pink area, the tribal areas. And this is an area where Pakistan law doesn't hold, but the most important guys didn't stay there. And I'm sorry, women, Al-Qaeda is a sexist organization. There are no senior female members in their leadership. Um, and so the, the senior leadership didn't stay there. It's really hard to run a global terror organization from this backwater tribal area. So most of the Al-Qaeda leadership that were caught, with Pakistan's help, by the way, and that's a, an interesting question, uh, are, are in Pakistan's major cities. But we have thought that we've defeated the Taliban and that we have wrapped up end of major military operations. But many of the things that, that we did really disconcerted President Musharraf. And we can talk about whether Musharraf would have undone the assistance had these things not happened or not. So for example, the Indo-US nuclear deal was something that really infuriated Musharraf. But we know by 2004, the Pakistanis are completely involved in rearming, training. The Taliban launched themselves as an insurgency in 2005. And just like what we saw with the Iraq War, the US and NATO forces in Afghanistan were very slow to pick up that they were actually confronting uh, an insurgency. It, by 2007, they're still debating this. Um, by 2008, it's really clear what's going on. But the problem that we have, and no matter what President Trump, the, you know, the, the Twitter troll in chief, says, he confronts the exact same problem that Presidents Obama and Bush faced. And, and this is summarized in a map. Um, I think the best map is, if we go to slide four, the basic problem is logistics. And I don't know if any of you in here have a military logistics background. Military logistics will trump strategy anytime. And if you look at Afghanistan, it's a landlocked country. We have to have what's called G-locks, ground lines of communication, to stay engaged in Afghanistan. And if you look at this map, and look at the, the middle map, you see Afghanistan's the darker green, uh, uh, Pakistan's the lighter green. What we have largely been doing, and to the left you'll see the, the ground lines of um, movement that we have been traditionally using. So how do you put pressure on the country that's literally taking our money with one hand and giving it to the Taliban with the other? And let's be really clear, our people were not being killed by Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan. They were largely being killed by the Taliban, which is Pakistan's proxy and their allied fighters. So I was an opponent of the surge, not because I, I am a, a, you know, a tree-hugging you know, peacenik, but rather because we were losing because of Pakistan. And the surge made us more dependent upon Pakistan. Now, so I, let, me, let me just get yeah. the, so the flow of uh, supplies to our troops yeah. in Afghanistan, as things are now, runs through Pakistan. And they have, at times, threatened to and even slowed down that pipeline. So the current situation is that, so in 2011, after a series of events, including Mr. bin Laden's uh, demise, the Pakistanis closed down these, what's called G-locks. And so we began resupplying our presence largely through Pakistani airspace. They're called the A-locks, the airlines of communication. We still use Pakistani ground routes to resupply the Afghans. Now, if you look at this map, and this is why I provide this, this chaos on the right. This was called the Northern Distribution Route. This was supposed to be our alternative to Pakistan. And if you actually go and you were to look at this, at this map, you'll see how absolutely preposterous this is. The Northern Distribution Route was never workable. It still is not workable. So this means that we are fighting a war in Afghanistan. We're being undermined by Pakistan. And yet, if the Pakistanis close down access to their airspace or their ground space, we would not be able to either sustain our presence or sustain our commitment to the Afghans. Let me ask this. Mm -hmm. What is the rationale for the Pakistanis to uh, side? I understand the financial incentive to maintain relationships with the United States. But um, what is their incentive for 
rebuilding the Taliban as you describe and maintaining that as a viable organization that is more than viable is actually gaining strength. Yeah. So to understand that, you have to look at that second map. So there is another route into Afghanistan, and that's Iran, right? And in fact, the Indians have been building a port, and you see that little dotted line that goes from India to Iran, that's the port in Chabahar. And so you see there's this very nice alternative ground route that the Indians and the Iranians have built. Obama, with the JCPOA, created an opportunity. The, Iran, the, the nuclear deal. The, the Iran nuclear deal um, created an opportunity uh, that we could have outsourced some of this logistics to the Indians, say to the Indians, private sector contractors, just as we do Pakistani private sector contractors, get this stuff into Afghanistan. Because that's what we do with Pakistan. It's not government suppliers. These are private sector contractors. And um, obviously, the Trump administration doesn't understand that you, if you're going to stay in this country, in Afghanistan, and you want to win, you have to decide which one of these two countries is less evil. From Pakistan, and by the way, I, I will say very clearly it's Pakistan. Pakistan is a global menace. Um, Iran, on the best day, aspires to be a nuclear proliferating state sponsor of terror that Pakistan is. I mean, I mean Iran is like in the junior leagues compared to Pakistan, right? But to go to your question, it's not just about India, but a lot of it does derive from India. They are afraid of Indian encirclement. And the fact is the India, Pakistanis are. the Pakistanis are. So if you look at that map, the Indians are much closer uh, to the Iranians than they are Pakistan. The Iranians, uh, the Afghans and the Indians are very close to the Indians. In fact, the Afghans can't stand the Pakistanis because of the destruction that they, on their own, have commenced in that country since 1974. And the Central Asian countries are closer to India. So Pakistan's worst fears are that um, a government that's stable in Afghanistan. in Afghanistan that Pakistan has no control over will simply hand over their space to the Indians to support that western border with Afghanistan, which historically the Afghans have not made their own lives remotely easier by rejecting that border. Um, at different points in time, supporting the different insurgencies in Pakistan along that border. And then there's also evidence at different points in time of the Indians working through the Afghans supporting those insurgencies. So this is really about Pakistan feeling surrounded and feeling that the only thing they can count on are these Islamists who will be beholden to Pakistan. Now, this hasn't worked out. Right, because some of the Taliban hate the Pakistanis as much as us, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but that's in in a complicated geographical way why Pakistan is so committed to making Afghanistan a client. You know, in a strange way, the situation you're describing <clears throat> puts the U.S. war in Afghanistan as almost a secondary consideration for all the other actors. That is to say, we want what we want, but that doesn't seem to rise to the top of the list for any of the other countries that you've mentioned here. So yes and no. I mean, I think our allies, so it's been a long war, right? So I mean, at this point, the war can have a driver's license. Pretty soon, it'll be old enough to vote. Um, so at different points in time, the neighbors wanted different things. So initially, Iran was very supportive. Right? Because, in fact, they were also supportive of the invasion of Iraq because they hated the Taliban. They hated Saddam Hussein. We did Iran an enormously um, large service. And actually, Iran was very supportive of the Afghan effort. They were very helpful to the Americans um, uh, at Bonn. And they got rewarded for this cooperation by being branded part of the axis of evil. So over time, Iran has at time facilitated al-Qaeda movements. Um, particularly where you see Iran sharing a border with Afghanistan. They've provided um, IEDs, uh, you know, improvised explosive device apparatus. So tactical support to the Taliban, even though strategically um, they're not interested in them. India has benefited from our military presence because under our security umbrella, it's been able to reestablish its traditional uh, presence in consulates and embassies. The Chinese have really benefited um, you know, as a colleague of mine used to say, we're going to fight to the last Marine to make Afghanistan safe for Chinese exploitation. 
But the security situation in Afghanistan is so dire that even the Chinese don't want to exploit it. So at different points in time, these different neighbors have, have wanted different things. Mm -hmm. And I think right now, their biggest concern and the biggest question mark is really what is President Trump going to do? And this conflict that part of our government has with China, with, with, with China and Russia really complicates the hedging strategy that all of these countries around Afghanistan are, are undertaking. Now, at the beginning of this year, uh, the president announced suspension of aid to Pakistan. Now, as you've written in a number of places, there's all kinds of aid coming from all kinds of different American programs. Some is economic support, some is military support, some is state building support, essentially. Um, and that the threat to cut off aid, or in fact, the actual cutting off of aid is not the recourse uniquely of the Trump administration. It has happened in the yeah. past. The Obama administration, the Bush administration, you mentioned earlier the various embargoes and boycotts by the U.S. government in Pakistan. Yet, one, we don't seem actually to stop the flow of aid. And two, it doesn't, whatever we do cut doesn't seem to stop anything from happening the way we don't want it to happen. So that's really true. Um, so the other thing you have to look at is what was the purpose of those sanctions? So when we imposed sanctions on the Pakistanis in 1979, within a matter of a few years, and by 1982, those sanctions are lifted because we need to figure out a way of moving money through Pakistan because of the, the Soviet invasion. But what people don't appreciate is that Pakistan actually had developed a nuclear weapon, we know from Pakistani sources, as early as 1984. So we impose nuclear-related sanctions in 1990, a little bit like you know using birth control after you're pregnant, um, and so we have a so there is this attribution error, right? We, we'll say well sanctions didn't work. Well, of course sanctions couldn't work in 1990 because they were not terror-related. They were nuclear proliferation-related, and they had already proliferated. But your the general question is, once you understand that this is one of Pakistan's most significant national security interests. We have an asymmetry of interest. Pakistan wants to do this more than we have tools to punish it. It's a this, really this simple... This being nuclear development. Well, well, that for sure. The nuclear development, by the way, is what enables Pakistan to continue using terrorists in Afghanistan and India. Right, because the Americans are afraid of walking away and taking our checkbook because we are coerced by this, this idea that if somehow we're not there writing checks, Pakistan's going to fall and then the terrorists get the nuclear weapons. So let me, let me come to this piece you wrote for foreign policy. I'm going to read you a quote from it and get you to elaborate further. <clears throat> uh, why is it that the United States continues to make huge payouts to Pakistan even though it's widely recognized that the country continues to fund the very organizations that are killing U.S. troops and allies in Afghanistan. First, Pakistan has the fastest growing nuclear program in the world. You actually refer to battlefield, that small size and perhaps looser kinds of weapons. Uh, America and its allies are rightly concerned that any instability in Pakistan may result in terrorists getting their hands on Pakistan's nuclear technology, fissile material, or a nuclear device. Second, related to the first, the United States worries about Pakistan's solvency. Pakistan has essentially developed its bargaining power by threatening its own demise. With any economic collapse of Pakistan, Washington again fears that the specter of a nuclear-armed terrorist group rising up from Pakistan will materialize. Now, this is not a fanciful scenario, even in a relatively stable Pakistan. So I actually think this, Pakistan is more stable than people think. I, I call it a stable instability. So this idea that Pakistan is going to crumble, it's a bargaining power of stop me before I shoot myself. I usually say pull the trigger because you're not going to do it. Um, they are much more stable than people appreciate. And, and this is actually the beauty of Pakistan. I often am accused of being anti-Pakistan. I'm actually anti-terrorism and anti-ISI, which is the intelligence agency that orchestrates it. But if you actually spend time in Pakistan during a crisis, you see something totally profound. So I was there during the 2010 flood when about um, a third to a fifth, depending on how you uh, classify 
the population was affected. These floods were biblical in scale, and it was... These are tens of millions of people you're talking about. Uh, uh, the, the tragedy that beset Pakistan in those floods made Haiti look like a cakewalk. And Pakistan got a fraction of the funds that Haiti got. Haiti today is still debilitated by, um, by its earthquake. You see no signs of this in Pakistan. And to see this up close is to actually see what makes Pakistanis so extraordinary. They're some of the most resilient people you'll ever meet. So what immediately happened at the village and sub-village level, people just began gathering resources. People began rescuing people. Uh, folks began donating whatever they could. And uh, this is not very well documented because people are not interested in the times when Pakistan does something extraordinary. But I kind of think of the, these local activities is the triage that happens on a battlefield. You know, we now have that stuff that you sprinkle in your wound or you stick a tampon in your wound. And that stabilizes you until, until you get to a medical facility. And that local aid that happened immediately is what kept that country going until the big aid started. And so yeah, there are so many things that Pakistan has experienced like this, losing half of its uh, population in 1971, and with a few years, it's still able to challenge India, right? So there is a resilience to Pakistan that's really quite, there's no other word for it, it's, it's moving. And it's not something that we tend to see on CNN. And so what I think will happen if we actually do what we need to do, which is really to cut them off, when we cut them off, I also think that Pakistan will undertake reforms. So we, this aid is killing Pakistan. We are actually undermining our own interests and we're undermining Pakistani democracy by this aid. And, and we're doing this in two ways. And Americans don't like to appreciate this. But the fundament of democracy is taxes. We pay our taxes and the scoundrels have to be accountable or we vote the scoundrels out. Pakistan is a rentier state in much the same way that Saudi Arabia is, right? People don't pay taxes, right? They get money from the outside and therefore there's no accountability. And uh, we have essentially been putting lubricant into a system that would ordinarily demand change. Right? Ordinarily, people would be furious that an army that has never won a war, and it's never won a war except its own democracy, and has started every single one of them, also is projected as the savior of the country and gets to eat whatever piece of the pie it wants, leaving the rest of the country to beg to the international community. No, in no place would be this be sustainable if it weren't for this infusion of outside funds at the IMF and elsewhere. Then there is this China thing, and the Pakistanis love to dangle, well, we're just gonna go to China. And I say, you know what, you do that. Because the Chinese aren't gonna be as forgiving as we have been. Um, the Chinese are engaging in a very extensive loan program to Pakistan, and like Chinese adventures elsewhere, there's no opacity. The Chinese basically set the price, the Pakistanis get the bill, they bring their own employees in, they'll bring their own resources in, and then Pakistan gets the variable quality infrastructure at a price it cannot service. So this is an interesting moral hazard problem. If we don't cut Pakistan off at the IMF, the American taxpayer is going to be subsidizing Pakistan's loan servicing to the Chinese, right? I mean, this is really perverse. And then this, the, the Americans, unfortunately, we don't have a national security elite right now that thinks about national security. But what we see happening um, in Sri Lanka, where the Chinese also did this in this useless port at Hambantota, the loan servicing is, is more than the, the, it's, than the port can ever generate a profit. What the Chinese basically said was, fine, give us the port. <laughs> so the Chinese essentially have a sovereign port in Sri Lanka. And they're doing this in Burma. They're doing this in Bangladesh, although the Bangladeshis are, are, are a little bit more uh, wary of them. And so then we have, so we're, with respect to uh, this port that the Chinese are building in Pakistan, the Americans are really, again, at the horns of another dilemma. Do we basically keep the Pakistanis from defaulting and having to give the Chinese access to this port, a la Hambantota, or do we encourage Pakistan to engage in fiscal irresponsibility by continuing to support them at the IMF, which will ultimately mean that we're gonna be funding their payouts to the Chinese. There are no good options for Pakistan in, in, in the United States. There just aren't any. And, and Trump can tweet all he wants. 
he, he's, I assure you, his national security team is no better than previous national security teams. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's really hard to be optimistic either for Pakistanis or for us. Let me ask then. Or for Afghans, actually, the worst victims. You know, you, you talk about this nuclear risk, and it, it is real. Um, and you talk about some of the loose handling of, the, of these weapons. I mean, let's hear a little bit about that so that does the risk of unwanted proliferation, unwanted even by the Pakistanis, uh, does that exist even in spite of the controls the Pakistanis claim over their own nuclear weapons? So I, I kind of call the BS flag on this for a couple of reasons. What enables Pakistan to be a rogue state with impunity and to continue getting our money is its nuclear assets, right? So Pakistan has a very high incentive to keep control of these weapons, right? So at a structural point of view, if there wasn't what we would call reliable commanding control, the utility of this weapon from a Pakistani point of view diminishes. However, from a rent-seeking point of view, they themselves are the ones that encourage people to be afraid, right? So Amongst Pakistanis, the utility that it, that it reassures them that they can do what they do with impunity is this belief that they have solid command and control. They exploit us and our fears by encouraging doubts about their command and control. So what are the real issues? And um, when they are in the barracks, in their peacetime position, I'm not terribly concerned about them. I don't lose sleep over that. I am concerned about a couple of situations. One, when a conflict begins, they move these weapons out of their peacetime locations for potential use, because after all, Pakistan has a first use strategy. This, when they're out of their barracks, they're more vulnerable to um, theft. The other thing that they do, they're constantly moving these weapons around as a part of their deniability strategy, and if we believe the news reports, and I'm 50-50 on believing these news reports, they move them in thin-skinned normal vehicles, like ambulances. Now, the argument would go that these are not suspected of carrying nuclear materials, and therefore they're at a less risk to being um, attacked. But if they were attacked, there's very little that could be done to protect those assets. So I... I put a big question mark around the reliability of that reportage, but what we do know is they move them around. Um, we also know that the Pakistan army has been infiltrated. We know this because we've seen these high-level attacks that have had insider information. The attacks uh, by Pakistani military, ostensibly on Pakistani military bases. Well, attacks by terrorists on Pakistani bases. Like, With the help of insides, of, insiders of, of insiders. of the military, yeah. Yeah, very very precise information about where certain units were. Um, so we know that there's insider problems. The other thing with these tactical nuclear weapons is that this is, the Pakistanis are basically taking our doctrine from the 1950s, right, from Cold War Europe. The problem is we don't know about the two-man rule. We don't know command and control once these things are deployed. And that is, that is an issue of concern. And I, the reason why I publicly, and this, as I know, is public, I, in my writings, I try to not be hysterical about this because they exploit that hysteria financially. And I'm of the belief that if we turn this around and we say to them, we're kind of tired of being blackmailed by you. You say you're a responsible nuclear weapon state. If you're, and we know what your signature looks like, the nuclear signature, because of um, the uh, investigations in Iraq, um, the Libyans, and we, because the Pakistanis were the ones giving this nuclear technology, and also because of the investigations of the Iranians, um, we have an idea what their signature looks like. I'm of the belief that we should simply say to them, you are responsible for your materials. And if it gets into the hands um, of non-state actors, or if you use nuclear weapons in a first use against India, we are going to respond to you appropriately per our doctrine. And in other words, instead of us trying to manage 
question marks about their command and control. We simply make the costs of their screwing up inordinately high. And that's, that's an approach that unfortunately you'll find very few takers in Washington because policymakers are risk averse, mm -hmm. right? They'd rather see Pakistan, the example I give, although youngsters don't know these things ever existed, is the parking meter. Remember in the old days we put a quarter in and maybe we're supposed to get 15, but we actually got like five because the thing was broken because like these things are a scam anyway. But to a policymaker, they would rather work with, Pakistan is a broken meter. We put, we're buying 15, but maybe, maybe we're getting three, but we're getting three consistently. If we do something extraordinarily different, we might get negative 15. Right? This is the sort of risk averseness of policymakers, right? And look at our policymakers crying out loud. I mean, they do like arm workouts, but they don't do spine workouts. So if we think that they're going to um, be serious and provocative uh, on, on Pakistan when they can't be serious or provocative about anything else, I, I'm not holding my breath. But that's, that's, that's the complexity of it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We're basically holding ourselves hostage to Pakistan's tantrums. So let me shift a little bit because um, you write as well in terms of the development of some of these different uh, jihadist groups that Pakistani supports, but the spread of this, and we go back to the uh, political map, I want to just show everybody uh, Bangladesh, which is now a country where some of these issues have occurred. So you see on the map, you see where Pakistan is, and all the way on the other side of India in yellow, you see Bangladesh, which used to be Eastern Pakistan. <laughs> and the war that you described was the separation of those two elements of Pakistan. And when you speak to Pakistanis, this is considered an ongoing national tragedy. This was a terrible loss in their history and so on. So um, it certainly conditioned them, given India's role in supporting Bangladesh and so on, to have suspicions of the Indians. And Bangladesh, in its own development, decided on a very different path, at least ostensibly so. So pick up the story for us of a state that in the early 1970s emerges from this war, declares itself a secular state, um, and more inclined to identify along ethnic rather than religious lines as Pakistan has. Um, and yet the transformation in that country is feeding on many of the same currents that have created this radicalism in Pakistan and Afghanistan and so on and so forth, raising the possibilities of new threats that are not at this point really being recognized. So that's really, but that's, there's a lot in that question because A, very few people know about Bangladesh. Um, the Pakistanis, as you noted, this is, uh, this is something that they continue to lugubriously repine. But what the Pakistanis do not themselves acknowledge publicly is that they lost East Pakistan not because the Indians intervened. They actually lost East Pakistan beginning in the 50s because they treated the ethnic Bengalis in East Pakistan execrably. Um, I could, I, you know, I, at Georgetown I do a whole hour lecture about the things that Pakistan did from 47 to 1954 alone, right? So the Pakistanis like to focus upon the Indian intervention, but they take no responsibility to the racism, the um, religious exclusive, uh, the religious exclusion policies that Pakistan adopted. Remember, or if you didn't remember, now you'll know, that when Pakistan became independent, about 25% of its population were not Muslim. Most of them were Hindus, and most of that non-Muslim population lived in Bangladesh. So Pakistan early on adopted what's called the Objectives Resolution that says there's going to be no law that's repugnant to Allah. Well, that's a terrible law if you're not a Muslim, right? I mean, it's, it's fair, who would want to live in a situation like this? And then um, the, Bangladeshi, the, the Bangladeshi Muslim was uh, frequently characterized in racial epithet terms. They weren't considered to be real Muslims because of their close proximity to Hindu Bengalis. Their language wasn't recognized as a national language, so they were deprived access to government employment. And because they weren't considered a martial race by the British, nor were they in the military. And so when Pakistan had its first coup by Ayub Khan in the late 50s, Bangladeshis were literally excluded from all access to power. Um, 
They were politically excluded, they weren't in the military, they couldn't work in the bureaucracy. And so this, had, this was a long march. And what the Pakistanis did in 1970 was uh, after the party that represented the Bengalis in the East, the Awami League, won an outright majority, the Western Pakistani elites didn't want to seat that government because they didn't want to be ruled by, quote, racial epithet, racial epithet. So this is, uh, and then that's really what made the independence irre irrevocable, because the Awami League figured out playing by the rules doesn't work. You know, we won fair and square. We won probably the cleanest election in Pakistan's history. And they refused to seat the government. And then as refugees began pouring into India, um, we, we know that initially India was very hesitant to intervene because some of those folks were leftists. At this time, India was experiencing its own Marxist insurgency. India was very uh, hesitant about this. And they also didn't want the precedent because India also had insurgencies. Right? They didn't want the precedent of an outside actor liberating a disgruntled group within their country. But eventually we know what they did. Throughout the summer, they began training the rebels. Um, the uh, Indian army began moving assets from the west to the east. They began putting air assets into place. And technically speaking, the war began in uh, the, the war began when Pakistan struck air assets, Indian air assets. So, so technically, Pakistan did begin the war, and, and the end was as we know it. But many of the um, instruments that the Pakistani state used to oppress East Pakistanis were Islamists. So Jamaat Islami had a couple of militias that did very brutal things, and they were collaborators in the war crimes that the Pakistan army committed. And because of the Islamism that the Pakistani state was using to suppress ethnic tendencies, the state became independent as an ethnic state, really averse to Islamism. But what happened almost immediately, because Pakistan and Bangladesh shared this shared history of coup making, the very first military coup, which happened very quickly because um, the first leader of Bangladesh was himself very corrupt and authoritarian and, and really not a good dude. Um, the first coup happened, and this begins the process of re-legitimizing Islamists. And so Bangladesh moves from being adamantly opposed to Islamists to now that they are a Bengali majority state, they're reconsidering the place of Islam in their society. And also there were Bengalis, Bangladeshis that went to the original Afghan war. So this is an incredibly complex story from the South um, in the 80s, there were also Rohingyas. By the way, the Rohingya crisis is not new. It's been ongoing for, ever since Myanmar became independent in 1948. So the, many Bangladeshi Muslims found themselves caught up in these global jihad concepts. And now you know, we have ISIS in Bangladesh. And these are not poor terrorists. These are some of, uh, some of Bangladesh's most well-educated urbane youth. Uh, one of the fellows that went to fight in Syria and was featured in Dabak magazine, um, or, uh, or was it one of the holy, the holy bakery attackers, I, I forget which one, I apologize, was actually a finalist in, in the Bangladeshi version of Who's Got Talent, right? So these are not poor urchins from madrasas. Bangladesh has a problem, and this current government isn't helping. I, that's another long discussion, is this government tries to consolidate um, her authoritarian rule She's constricting space for legitimate Islamist actors to participate. That's never a good recipe. Take a look at Turkey, for example. Let me ask, though, you, you, um, you talk about the appeal of both al-Qaeda and Islamic State in Bangladesh, and you distinguish between the kinds of people who are recruited for each of them. Can you, who's drawn to al-Qaeda, who's drawn to ISIS, and what's the difference there? So there is a, there's a big ideological difference. So in South Asia, and I can't speak to other parts of the world because I only study South Asia, Al-Qaeda is very closely associated with the Taliban and a particular interpretive tradition called Deobandism. So the Afghan Taliban, most of the militant groups in Pakistan, they're Deobandi. Interestingly enough and ironically, Deoband is actually originating in India, but these guys bear no resemblance to their Indian Deobandi uh, co-religionists. So there has been this long-standing 
reliance of Deobundi militants upon madrasas. And so the Al-Qaeda Taliban folks, you'll see many more people coming from madrasas. They're less well-educated. ISIS, in, in contrast, it, is one of my, my Bangladeshi colleagues named Ali Riaz, who you should really have, he's really superb on this stuff. He described, it's like, why would, you, why would you have like an old Nokia phone when you can get the newest iPhone? And that's the comparison between Al-Qaeda and ISIS. Al-Qaeda is your father's terrorist group, right? ISIS is the new, fresh terrorist group. And, and they're seen to have a very different set of goals. And so they're, they're very different in, in terms of the kinds of attacks that they do, in terms of the kind of um, young men that they attract. What are the different goals that are attributed to the, each of them? So Al-Qaeda is no longer seen as this global terrorist organization, mm -hmm. right? This idea of a global caliphate, or I guess Americans say caliphate. And in fact, you know, bin Laden, never really spoke that way either. Like bin Laden had very specific goals. And we know he had a huge falling out, right, with Zarqawi, and, and that's why Iraq went in the sectarian way. And th this is Al-Qaeda central, or Al-Qaeda Indian subcontinent, is not sectarian. Like they're not into deciding who is the right Muslim. They're, they don't support the killing of Shia, they don't support the killing of Sufis. ISIS is a very sectarian organization, and they, are, they practice takfir, which is the idea that someone can declare you to be a kafir, a non-believer, and that they can kill you. So doctrinally, these two organizations are very different. And so um, Al-Qaeda will talk about wanting Bangladesh to be an Islamic state. ISIS will talk about wanting Bangladesh to be part of a global caliphate. And that latter aspiration, you say, is more appealing to a better educated, higher quality yes. recruit. I mean, what is that connection? So I mean, it's, it's a puzzlement, because we also see this in Pakistan. Uh, I, I do a lot of survey work. And then actually, I'm, I'm analyzing data as we speak, um, um, data in Bangladesh um, about people who support different kinds of groups and why. But in Pakistan, the data are really clear that the people that are most supportive of the nastiest of terrorist groups, they are Pakistan's cosmopolitan elites. They are more likely to be educated. They're more likely to not be wealthy. And in fact, the people that dislike them the most are, in fact, the urban poor. And the reason is these terrorist groups, they don't attack randomly within cities. They don't attack wealthy neighborhoods. Right? They attack the poorest of neighborhoods. They attack Sufi shrines where poor people live. And so the negative externalities of that terrorism is born differentially by the urban poor. Now, Bangladesh is just a lot more complicated. So in the survey data that I'm analyzing that we just collected um, a year ago, about one in three Bangladeshis who have heard of the three terrorist groups that we ask about support the goals of these groups. Um, a much smaller number, one to three percent, support the means. Uh, and so, but when you think of a country of roughly with 160 million Muslims and a large number of non-Muslims, that small number is actually a very large number, right? It's a small percentage, but a it, large it, number of people. Yeah, it's a small percentage, but a large number of people. And terrorism is really a small numbers game, right? You don't need to have, in, in fact, terrorism, is, we don't think about it as a, as a hire of labor, right? But terrorism as a profession is actually demand constrained. So as long as they have more people that want to be a terrorist than they actually have the ability to absorb, they can turn people away, right? Which is one of the reasons why, if we look at the 9-11, Attackers, in general, if we look at attributes, and I have a database of Pakistani terrorists, in general, they're better educated than, than the communities from which they draw. Mm -hmm. I think part of that is because it's, we, a lot of- The groups people, can be more selective. They can be, they're hirers of labor. I mean, even McDonald's, you know, doesn't take the, the worst candidate to be a burger steamer. 
right? Um, you they know, used to flip when I was in school. We actually flipped the burgers. Now they just steam them. I didn't but. know that. Um, really? I, I, you know, this is, you, you're coming from all directions here, I have to say. I do a lot of road trips. <laughs> and my dogs yeah, I, love McDonald's cheeseburgers. I love them. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go anywhere yeah. near this. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, you know, I, I'm just, we'll take some questions from the audience in a minute, but you know, I'm so interested in the track. I mean, you've worked in government, you've worked in policy I've analysis. I've never worked in government. Well, the U.S. into peace, but I mean, yeah. um, but you've been in the field with different government or quasi-government agencies. You've done analysis work for think tanks. You're in the academy, no doubt in various places, and you've been in many of the places we're looking at on the map repeatedly. I mean, you're crossing paths with people who are doing all kinds of work for the government. And I'm curious as to how you see the development of those kinds of relationships and information flows. I mean, certainly, I'm not now necessarily talking about a policy level, but in the years since 9-11, the government and the supporting community of analysts and think tanks and so on has really built up this enormous knowledge base in fields that were essentially ignored before 9-11. And I'm wondering how you see the development of that infrastructure and how that does or doesn't connect with decisions that are made at a policy level? So that is such a profoundly important question. But let me say this. Um, uh, so I'm here by accident. I was- well, we invited you. I, yeah. Well, no, no, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. But this wasn't the career I wanted. This was not the career I wanted. I, I actually wanted to be, um, my PhD is in South Asian language and civilizations. I wanted to be a professor of Punjabi literature. I wrote my dissertation on Punjabi literature. But like many women, um, I was just sexually harassed out of my PhD program. And um, it's just because I am very cussed that I finished. I finished it remotely working at RAND. My, one of the most prestigious professors, and I will say his name because I'm fearless to pest track Rabarthi. You know who you are and you know what you said. He asked me, um, as I'm handing in my final paper, in my first year of graduate school, are you looking for sexual pleasure? The University of Chicago, we would have recognized this as, and I've been very, oh, I've written about this, I've talked, there's, this is, this is, there's this no reveal. This guy, he's a serial predator. In Chicago, um, when, I, when I filed a complaint immediately after this went down, and I was told that, um, in fact, he had violated nothing, that faculty were allowed to proposition students, and had he not asked me, how would he know? if I wanted to have intercourse with him. How could he possibly know? And that moreover, I would have to tell him that that was not desired if I wanted to ensure that he would not do it again. It was just extraordinary. And obviously, you know, I, and, and I, I had to literally ambush him at the International House to tell him that this was not wanted. And you can imagine what that relationship was like. Um, it was just unbearable to be at the University of Chicago. So, um, and I did not have parents, and I was afraid of being unemployed in a, it's like, who isn't afraid of being unemployed? So uh, I did an MA in public policy while I was doing my PhD, and I went to the Rand Corporation, where I was working when 9-11 happened. And, um, you know, it, it's, this is women in this business, uh, little did I know that I left <laughs> one field because of sexual harassment to go to another field, which is even worse. You know, it's like, I, so now I tell my female students, um, gender discrimination, it's like gravity. You know, it is what you make of it. You can either rollerblade on gravity or you can fall down and, you know, smash your head. It's not going to go away. Um, I see the young women that are in my classroom, they're dealing with the same stuff that I went through. Um, Me Too is, is a very limited phenomenon, but in the academy, the academy is a place that protects predators, it, full stop. So gentlemen, if you want to be a sexual harasser with job security, get yourself tenure. I'm telling you straight up, and all, <laughs> totally. And also women, if you want to be a predator, get tenure, because women harass men at the University of Chicago too, which is horrible, terrible. When, when she, Zilla, crawls out of Lake Michigan, I hope she stomps over to Hyde Park and just takes that place out. Um, it, because it's still the same way. And so to go to your question, so how, do, so how does, no, but, 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 
But this is real. I mean, this is how I ended up here. This mm. wasn't the life I wanted. I really, do you think I want to go to a place like Afghanistan where my friends were murdered? I mean, where I'm attacked in my hotel room. I, this, this is like the reality of this kind of job. And so I'm, it's very bittersweet for me because I wanted to be a professor of Punjabi literature and not a professor of terrorism. But I'm at the Rand Corporation, um, which was, you know, just, I just followed like Brownie in motion. And then 9-11 happens. And then, oddly enough, my entire life changes and um, in a way that I could never have planned it. I, I could not have planned it. So I think what I've seen is that from the academy side, and Georgetown is very different, I, I think most of, I would not be hireable. I, in fact, if you go and see what other people at other universities say about me, they think I'm a baby-killing warmonger, right? So, in general, academia is very hostile to this stuff. In general, government is hostile to this kind of stuff because they view us as being unsympathetic to what they're trying to do. So there's a very small number of academics who move, basically we're, we're loathed optimally in both sides. But for example, certain government agencies wanted to hire me immediately after 9-11 because of my language skills. And um, I'm not clearable by the CIA because I had um, intimate relations with, with non-Americans, particularly you know, gentlemen that weren't white. The sexism of that hiring process, again, it's still in place. So the people that they want, and we've been investing in linguists, we've got various programs like the Critical Language Fellowship Program. Inevitably, when you go and spend time in a country, you develop friendships with those people, and it makes you unclearable, right? So what will happen at the CIA, inevitably, and I've seen these people come and go, we get these kids with clean passports, clean relationships, right? Nothing, nothing funky, no one, was that a turban? Is he, is he very turban because he's a Sikh or because he's a Muslim, right? No, no complicated questions. Oh, you dated this guy named Bob. Okay, great, perfect. Is Bob from Kansas too, right? So. Actually, from my point of view, I see a tremendous dysfunctionality, right? So let's take the Pakistan embassy, for example. No one wants to go serve there because it's, it's not a prestigious post. It's not a family post. And so we need our A team, and we're getting our D team. So it's, it is definitely glass half full, glass half empty. Mm -hmm. But my argument would be, well, if it's a glass half full of cow piss, it's still cow piss. Do you really want to drink that? Probably not. So I, I, I don't think that that um, interface is as good as you might think it is. Mm -hmm. I think like the program I'm in at Georgetown, we're kind of an exception. I've got Bruce Hoffman, I've got Dan Byman, Victor Cha. Because Georgetown is so close to DC, right. we are an aberration. But your regular academic wouldn't even want to work for the government because academia, especially coming out of the, um, the Vietnam War, right this general hostility. The human terrain team project is a really good example of a great idea that was absolutely sabotaged by academics. The idea of the human terrain team was that we were gonna have anthropologists who speak these languages, who are comfortable hanging out. Um, but the American Anthropological Association basically said, anyone who does this, we're gonna blackball you. And I thought this was the most outrageous thing because all of us benefit from US government funds. They, they pay for our language skills. Um, they subsidize our libraries. And my view was if, you, if you're going to blackball someone who wants to work for the government, then you should give back every single government cent you got. Right? You can't have it both ways. Right? We didn't invest in you because we wanted you to resurrect you know, 15th century Buddhist poetry that was inscribed on a piece of rock that's managed to survive weather. Right? That's not why we did this. So I, I, I sort of... I'm at this intersection where I'm equally curmudgeonly of both academics as well as government because it's, we have so many resources, but these resources are structurally unable to communicate with each other because of confirmation bias and other forms of bias. Let's see if we have a question or two. <laughs> <laughs> and you can ask about confirmation bias if you're so inclined. Or... <laughs> oh, thank you. There we go. Oh, thank you. Uh, this gentleman here, please wait for a mic. We'll be right with you. 
Hi there. Uh, thanks for that. That was really informative. Um, I just have to share an anecdote with you. I'm, I'm from Pakistan. Soon after 9 11, uh, a colleague of mine decided to join the CIA uh, because he thought this was his calling. He's going to serve his country. Uh, a few months later, a gentleman from the CIA came to my office, asked my boss, like, you know, we are doing some QA, backgrounds check. My boss sends this guy to me, and he asks me all these questions about my colleague. Background question, does he do drugs, alcohol? And I'm waiting, is he going to ask me that I'm from Pakistan? <laughs> is he? Is he? He never asked anything about me. I was so disappointed. <laughs> yeah, okay, that, by the way, he hits upon a really interesting subject, right? Who does these background investigations? Right. A bunch, no offense to those if you're in the room who do it, a bunch of retired goobers. Who are who? I I, I I I can't even imagine that they're interested doing these background investigations. Because now I'm a professor. I you know my students in our program, a lot of them want to work in government. So I can't tell you how many of them have called me up. Um, and the oh, oh oh my goodness. So the South Asians, you'll get a kick out of this. So because I there was a time when I did a Beltway Bandit contracting, and so you have to have a clearance. And so after Edward Snowden, like we're going to clean up our act. We're going to get serious, and we're going to find the problem, people. So my brother-in-law is a Punjabi from the UK, and he has a funny name, even though he's British. They said, well, you have to fill out the special form for your brother-in-law. <laughs> he actually asked him, what is his tribe? I wrote Manchester United. Like, <laughs> 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 How preposterous is this? I, I, so I was like, well, we're going to have more Snowdens if this is stepping up your game. But no, this process, the, the people, it is like putting a pederast in charge of the playground. We are having some of the most incompetent people do the most important job. It is amazing to me. I'm so glad you raised that because I, I can't tell you know, how many times I've, had to, I've been interviewed for my students. And I'm like, I can't believe you just asked me that question. I, it's just absurd. But that's how, this how, that's how it rolls. Um, that's how it is. Just go in the back there. Please. <laughs> Hi. So you raised so many interesting uh, um, visuals. Uh, um, <laughs> one in particular, particular really stands out, though, when you were talking about the nuclear weapons in Pakistan. When you said that they, they could move them, you know, they move them to a wartime um, position, they move them like in an ambulance or a truck. When we see footage of North Korea and the nuclear weapons, they're showing these massive uh, weapons with uh, missile launches. And, you know, I, I personally have never seen a nuke, but my guess is that a nuke would be pretty huge and, 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 and it just can't. It's not something you could throw over, over the border, right? My guess is you need some type of launching equipment. So how do they, how, how is that, you know, because that seems pretty uh, frightening when you say that they, they could just move a nuke in a truck and worry about the nuke being kidnapped. You know, it's not like we're watching 24 or some uh, uh, television show. So can you explain that a little bit? Okay, so there is a debate in the scholarly literature. So there's essentially three processes that, that happen. So the first is that the cores, the nuclear cores, are mated with the warheads, right? Then the warheads are mated with a delivery device. Then the delivery device is deployed, right? So if you, if you looked at our doctrine, our missiles are always good to go, right? It's a little bit like, you know, Hefner back in the day. It's always good to go. So in those silos, because it was part of our doctrine, right? If we saw, if we picked up intelligence that the Soviets were going to, were, were going to nuke us, we weren't going to wait to see if that thing landed with a thud or not. So our doctrine was always keep them good to go. So in 2007, you may recall that we lost some nukes. We had some nuclear warheads that were just flying around on a B-52. So... We have what's called a nuclear triad, right? So we've got nuclear weapons that are in the possession of all of the services. 
Pakistan does not yet have a triad. India is working on a triad. So what, is this, what does this mean? Predominantly, the Pakistan army has command and control over, over these assets. And so the reason why they can move things around in a van is that they're not moving the mated, they're, mo they're not moving the mated warhead with the delivery vehicle. So Pakistan has a couple of delivery options. One, they're called TELs. Um, they're based trailer erector launched missiles. And that's what, when we see these military parades, which apparently we're gonna have too. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> uh, I wanna see some Minutemen, you know, going down Pennsylvania Avenue. So those, those are called TELs and you'll see the missiles put on. They love showing these things at parades. I mean, France apparently does this too. Um, but Pakistan can also uh, drop ordnance from nuclear capable aircraft like F-16. So that, that, that's the long and short, but they're probably moving around the warheads. I think my, my girlfriend, Farah John, is she here? You know this back. stuff. Harass her, she knows this better than I do. No, no, no harassment. <laughs> no, I mean, I mean in a good way, because she's smart as a tack, and she knows this stuff. Oh. <laughs> I'm, I, you know, I don't know what to do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> let's take one on this side, please. Hang on, just wait for the mic, please. Hi, thank you. I've been really entertained by your um, sparkle. I don't know how else to say it. <laughs> this is really the best panel discussion I have been to in years. I appreciate you so much. I have a question. You said all kinds of interesting things. You mentioned that. The military, um, the Pentagon was confused to label what was happening in Afghanistan or an insurgency until late 2008, 2009. But didn't George W. Bush sign an edict in 2002 saying the military wasn't in charge in Afghanistan, that it was the CIA that was in charge in Afghanistan? So it, it, if that's true, I'm not saying it's true, but I think it, I read it somewhere. When did the CIA cease to be in charge in Afghanistan and the military take over? And did that coincide with this realization all of a sudden that we were fighting an insurgency? You see, this is the magical question. Did you read Carlotta Gall's book? I, I didn't, but I know her. Okay, I love Carlotta Gall, love her. Okay, so this is the magical question. We actually were fighting two wars in Afghanistan. One was a counterterrorism war that was being fought by largely CIA and special operators. These are the guys that go out, slip, float. They do stuff that you don't want to do, um, you don't want to see done. And that, that was um, a very specific mission. Operation um, Enduring Freedom was their mission. Then there was a second mission, which was NATO-led, right? Which was at the time called ISAF, the International, I forget, now, now I'm forgetting what ISAF stands Security for. Security Assistance Force. Yes, exactly menopause brain, don't go through it. Um, so you had these two very different functions. And so what ISAF was doing, ISAF was assisting Afghanistan, as the name suggests. And they were training ANSF, the Afghan National Security Forces, um, whereas the counterterrorism folks were specifically focusing upon Al Qaeda. So this is why the United States for so long misunderstood the Pakistani game. If you were CIA, you loved Pakistan. Now they don't, by the way, that's changed. Because whenever there was some, you know, yakety yak going to Pakistan, there'd be some Al Qaeda number three, you know, pull, oh, we just caught Al Qaeda number three. Uh, by the way, that had to be like the worst job description ever. Because, you know, Al Qaeda number three. Because like they were constantly being nabbed and the, and the Pakistanis were turning them over. So if you were CIA, what you saw from the Pakistanis was cooperation on Al Qaeda. Because remember, in this period, we thought we had defeated the Taliban. It wasn't an issue for us. But what was happening on the military side is that increasingly we began to see stuff like, oh, what is this? The Taliban, they're fighting differently. And by the way, we weren't just seeing the Taliban. If you, if you talk to um, if you know anyone that served in Afghanistan, they'll tell you, in some cases, Pakistani military, the special services group, were fighting with the Taliban. I want you to let that sink in. 
We have given $34 billion and counting to Pakistan, and they are sending the special services group embedded with the Taliban who are killing us. And I guarantee you, if you ask anyone who served in Afghanistan, they will tell you this. And as a sister of soldiers, nothing makes me more angry than that. This is outrageous. But we missed this because of this interagency focus. So over time, DOD and our NATO ISAF partners are seeing the Taliban emerge, but the CIA is not looking at this. So you don't really begin, the CIA doesn't really start focusing on the Taliban problem well into the Obama administration. And part of that issue is the Bush administration really trusted Musharraf. I mean, just they, Bush loved Musharraf. I mean, in fact, the Pakistanis used to call, call the two men Busharraf. And, and, and the Pakistanis had a right to be angry because here we are saying we support democracy, and yet here we are supporting this man who's undermining democracy. And he's also undermining our, in, undermining our interests. Ambassador Crocker, an honorable man otherwise, is applauding Musharraf as a contributor to Pakistan's democracy while he's actually sending his goons to beat up actual activists for democracy, right? So this interagency story that you so presciently identified is actually part of this problem. And the GAO, the Government Accounting Office, not an office that you think of as a hero in national security, but they were. They said to the Bush administration, y'all have not done any assessment of this war like ever in the eight to seven years you've been in business. So in the summer of 08, the Bush administration began doing assessments and assessments and assessments. And then Obama, the candidate, hired Bruce Riedel to do an assessment of the assessments. So the, I'm not making this up, it's actually the assessment of the assessments. And so that's why Obama came in absolutely loathing Pakistan. Obama he didn't need to be taught that Pakistan was taking our money and killing our troops. He knew it. But going back to this map issue, what can you actually do? And then Obama finds himself pressured by McChrystal for the surge. I mean, I know for a fact the Obama administration was not interested in the surge. I had dinner with the vice president where he was supporting this idea of counterterrorism plus. But the military, and this is where Obama is to be faulted, he did not lead the military. The military led him. And by the time we had invested in the surge, it really became impossible to unscrew this. I mean, our military mission in Afghanistan was and remains a football bat. And, but that's, that's part of it, is that, so thank you for, that's just an incredibly prescient question, thank you. Well, this has really been extraordinary. I mean, we've ranged from, I mean, the complexities of this are <laughs> head spinning. It's really, yeah, it is. And, you know, and McDonald's technique for cooking burgers, so. <laughs> I don't know that we've done it all tonight, but we've done an awful lot, and I really, I'd really like you to join me in thanking Professor Christie. For <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you.